Pope Pius V. Pope St. Pius V may not have been the greatest diplomat, but he was a solid priest, whose main goal was to hold on to the sheep who were in the flock, and bring back those who had left the flock. He felt a great responsibility to try to bring back England to the Catholic Church. Henry was dead. Whatever happened was over. Let's pick up the pieces and reconcile. Henry's illegitimate daughter, Elizabeth I, had successfully ascended the throne of England after some frightening times. She did not trust many people, and no one in the Catholic Church. There were overtures to her to come back to the Church, but these were translated as means for the Spanish monarch to take over the country. We must remember that the first great insult to Spain was Elizabeth's father, Henry VIII, claiming that his marriage to Catherine of Aragon, a strong Spaniard, was illegal. Spain also had ulterior motives in wanting to expand their kingdom. So it was a combination of loyalty to the Pope, revenge for the outrage committed against Catherine of Aragon, a member of their royal family, and a desire to expand their colonies which influenced the minds of the monarchy of Spain. To the Spanish monarch's mentality, Elizabeth was never accepted as Queen of England because she was the daughter of Henry VIII and Queen Catherine's lady-in-waiting, Anne Boleyn. The Pope really didn't want to get involved in what was a very sticky situation which his predecessors didn't want to touch. Reality had to tell him that at this point, Elizabeth was in power in England. She had weathered many storms and looked like she would remain queen until her kingdom could be forcibly seized or her natural death. But she was queen at this time, and the Pope had to concern himself with the millions of English Catholics who were being denied their rights of religion. It's not said just how much diplomacy was attempted to reconcile the Church with Elizabeth. She may never even have known about many attempts which might have been made to bring England back into the fold. Her advisers had their own agenda, and for the most part, they were happy to be free from the Catholic Church in Rome. At any rate, Pope Pius V tried to invoke his God-given right to being above secular monarchs, especially in matters of the Church. After all diplomatic means were exhausted, and under pressure from Catholic monarchs, Pope Pius V issued a papal bull in 1570, excommunicating Elizabeth I and absolving the English people from obedience to her, and forbidding them to accept her as monarch. Well, you know how the English feel about their royalty, right or wrong. The current situation is a great indicator of this. The bull made the situation between the Church and Elizabeth worse than it had been, if that was possible. The rank-and-file Catholics in England loved their queen, they didn't want her to be Pope, but they were loyal to the throne anyway. They were caught in the middle. Loyal British Catholics had a major problem, because at this point in retribution the oath of allegiance, which had not been enforced to any great degree prior to this time, became a weapon to force Catholics to either give up their religion, or be branded traitors to England and to the Queen. The Church lost a lot of people in England and less in Ireland when this happened. But it did determine that the Catholic Church in England was defunct. What Martin Luther and John Calvin could not accomplish in Europe, Henry VIII and his followers accomplished in the British Isles. The Threat from the Other Side of the World we're not going to attempt to say that the pontificate of Pope St. Pius V was the most difficult in the history of the Church. There have been many at least as difficult or possibly more difficult. But suffice it to say he had a monumental task to accomplish for the Lord in the six years he held the reins of the Church. His problems never ran in sequence, one following upon the heels of another. That might have been too easy to handle. Rather, they always ran concurrently, everything coming at him at the same time from different directions. Isn't that always the way when you're working for the Lord? In the midst of the problems he was encountering, doing battle with the Protestants, and especially Elizabeth of England, he was also called upon to defend the Church from the other side of the world, the militant spread of the Muslim Turks. This was another situation his predecessor let fester, hoping it would go away. This plague had been going on for centuries. Europe had closed its eyes when the Turks under the leadership of Ottoman and his disciples had been taking over more and more of Asia and North Africa. Then they came into Spain in the 8th century, spreading into Francis as far north as almost reaching the city of Tours. They had begun with Sultan Ottoman Sultan Muhammad II. Following the success of his father in faith and mentor, Muhammad I, who had enjoyed great success by uniting his people and forming the Arab states in the 7th century, the Ottomans grouped together little principalities which had been overrun by the Mongols. It began loosely at the end of the 13th century, and over the next 200 years, gathered tremendous strength, eventually taking over all of the Near East, North African principalities of Syria, Egypt, Tripoli, and Tunisia. 
they were able to be successful in their campaign to make great strides in Europe for two simple reasons. They were becoming more and more united, adding small emirates into their Arab kingdom as they advanced, which attributed to their strength. On the other hand, the Europeans were becoming more separative, fighting with each other over everything, wasting all their resources at a time when they should have been uniting against a common enemy. Their focus was turned inward and towards themselves, and they didn't realize they were being swallowed up from the south. After Constantinople was captured by the Turks in 1453, which effectively ended the Eastern Roman Empire and opened up the Balkan states and Hungary to the onslaught of the Arabs, they began working their way over to Italy. This still did not get the attention of the Europeans, in particular the Italians, until the island of Cyprus was jeopardized. The rich merchants in Venice earned much of their income from Cyprus as a port city. That was one of the reasons the Turks wanted it. The powers that be in Venice attempted to maintain their control of Cyprus diplomatically, by being friendly with the Turks. Sounds a lot like how the whole world reacted to Hitler in the 1930s, they thought it worked, because they didn't know that their enemies were shrewder than they. It was only when the Sultan, Selim II demanded the surrender of Cyprus that the Venetians realized that they had not been very cunning. They were in trouble, and did the natural thing, they went running to the Pope. Pope St. Pius V was aware of what had been happening at the hands of the Muslims. He also realized that if they were able to, they would successfully put all Italians, nay all Catholics, under the heels of the unbelievers, as they had the Spaniards for 700 years. But with all his other problems all over the world, he, as the rest of Europe had done, put the situation with the Turks on the back burner until he could get some of these other problems resolved. But now the Venetians had come to him for immediate aid. They were afraid their island port would be taken away from them by the Arabs, and knew that was just the beginning. They recalled how Yugoslavia had been taken over. A campaign was designed to meet the Arabs on the field of battle in Greece, across from the south of Italy. It was best to try to stop the invasion before it got close to their own shores. All the powers committed to certain amounts of military equipment, including ships, guns, bows and arrows, and whatever type of weapons of war might have been used at that time. Actually, it was a means of uniting these separate powers, if only for this one battle. Spain would pay one-half, Venice one-third, and the Pope would pay one-sixth of the co saint of the total number of ships sent, Venice provided 108. Naples 29, Genoa 14, Spain 13, the Pope 12 and Malta 3. Don Juan of Austria, half-brother of Philip II of Spain, was chosen as the leader of the operation. Everything had been put into place for an offensive at the beginning of October in 1571. They gathered at the coast of Messina, on the tip of Sicily. Their advance scouts returned from the area where the Arabs were stationed. They advised the heads of the fighting expedition and the papal delegation representing His Holiness, Pope Pius V, that they were greatly outnumbered. On the foremast of the main ship being controlled by Don Juan of Austria, a banner bearing the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, was placed. She had appeared to Juan Diego only forty years before in Mexico. In 1531, the Pope had a word sent to all the people in Sicily, as well as throughout the entire Catholic world to begin a rosary crusade. The only way the Catholics could be victorious over the Arabs was through prayer. From Messina, the Christian ships sailed down the Greek coast and crossed the Gulf of Lepanto, near the tip of Ithaca. There they discovered the enemy. When the Christian troops estimated their opponent's strength, they concurred with the information they had received at Messina. They were heavily outnumbered. However, with Our Lady at the helm of the ship, being represented by the banner of Guadalupe, this grossly undermanned remnant of His Holiness was victorious over the enemy. The Arabs fled from the area, sustaining a loss of over 30,000 men and a great deal of ships. It was here that the onward thrust of the Muslims was effectively stopped. It was done through the prayers of the people of God and the intercession of Our Mother, Our Lady of Guadalupe. It is said that all during the campaign, Pope Pius V prayed, at times in an attitude similar to Moses on the mountain, with his hands raised towards heaven. He called for fasting and rosaries to be prayed in all the churches in Rome and wherever the word could be spread. At the Church of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva in Rome, petitions were pouring out during the heat of the battle. It is said that Pope St. Pius V was in the middle of a business meeting at the crucial point in the battle, which was taking place some 500 miles away. At a point he stopped, went to the windows of the Vatican, opened them and listened for a time, as if in ecstasy. Then he turned with tears in his eyes and a smile on his face. He spoke to those with whom he was holding his meeting. He said to them, This is not a moment to talk business, 
Let us give thanks to God for the victory He has granted to the arms of the Christians. In honor of Our Lady's aid in winning this battle, the Feast of Our Lady of Victory was instituted by Pope St. Pius V. The feast day is October 7. In recent years the name of the feast has been changed to Our Lady of the Rosary, but held on the same day. In addition he placed the invocation, Our Lady, help of Christians into the litany of Our Lady. Who was this Pope, and why is he a saint? Pope St. Pius V was a man of God, truly a man of prayer, a holy man. While this is not to say the other popes were not men of prayer, the difference here is that he depended solely on prayer. His ongoing philosophy was, God would move men's hearts, men would not move men's hearts. Pope Pius V brought his Dominican way of life into the papacy. He brought spirituality back into the office. Again this is in no way a criticism of any of the popes who have lived, especially those who were so influenced by the world of Renaissance, in which Pope St. Pius V was smack in the middle. But unlike many of his predecessors, he was not a Renaissance pope. He didn't care that much about paintings or buildings or works of art. One of his great accomplishments as Pope was raising St. Thomas Aquinas to the distinction of Doctor of the Church in 1568. St. Thomas was the first saint given that distinction after the early Church Fathers. Prior to this, the last Doctor of the Church was St. John Chrysostom. All of these doctors' titles had been given before 750a. The Pope St. Pius V was so impressed with the works of the angelic doctor, as St. Thomas was called, that in addition to declaring him Doctor of the Church, he sponsored a 17-volume edition of the complete works of Thomas Aquinas, which were recommended to be used in all seminaries. There were those who criticized Pope St. Pius V for trying to turn Rome into a monastery. That was an exaggeration, of course, but the truth lay somewhere in between. Rome was in need of reform. He was trying to refocus this, his city, the city of the Church, back to where it should have been, facing God. Keep in mind that this dear man had so many strikes against him. He had the Protestants from one end, the Muslim infidels from another end, and he ruled in the midst of the Renaissance, one of the most ungodly periods in the history of the Church. Happily, through all the complaining about how Rome had to change and reflect more its major inhabitant, the Church of Jesus Christ and his main representative, sweet Christ on earth, there were many compliments on how the attitude of Romans changed during the brief pontificate of St. Pius V. For that short time, it did become a holy city. A point of interest might be the fact that the white clothes the popes wear in these modern times comes from St. Pius V, who, upon ascending the throne of the papacy, donned the white vestment of the Dominican order, and had it modified to suit his station of pope. His background had been the Inquisition. As we mentioned previously, this Inquisition was not the same as that of Spain, which had begun after the Catholic kings had finally taken their country back from the Muslims. This office of the Inquisition was to deal with Lutherans, Calvinists and Huguenots in France, Germany, and Switzerland, who were pouring over the borders into Italy to bring their heresies to the people of God in this country. It was not easy to control dissidents and stem the tide of heresy, which was rampant all over Europe when he assumed office. The office of the Inquisition of Italy was more recently called the Holy Office, and is now called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and is chaired by Cardinal Ratzinger. The Roman office of the Inquisition was begun by Pope Paul III in 1542, just when Protestantism and Calvinism were sweeping the north of Europe. He had good reason to weed out heretics, and to put the fear of God into would-be heretics. Granted at the beginning the methods of the Inquisition were anything but democratic. A rumor or a whispered accusation was enough to bring someone before this autonomous group of people. There was virtually no defense allowed, no confronting of accusers. It was an extreme form of backlash against those who would destroy the Church. When Pope St. Pius V was a Dominican priest, he had been made an inquisitor by Pope Paul V and then by Pope Pius IV. There had been an inquisitor's palace in Rome before he began his pontificate. It was destroyed after the death of Pope Paul IV by an angry mob. There were those who believed that the Inquisition had outlived its usefulness, it was old-fashioned for these times of enlightenment, this period of Renaissance and so it had never been rebuilt. But to an old warhorse like Pope St. Pius V, who had eventually been given the title of Inquisitor for life, it was a very necessary means of combating the enemy. So he brought it back into full effect. Only God can be the judge as to its successes. It was able to discourage many who would feel the freedom to take potshots at the official church and engage in heretical activities. From the time of Pope St. Pius V, 
the Office of Inquisition, now the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, has always had Dominicans, watchdogs of God, in key positions. This has always been justified by the fact that the first Inquisition was carried out under the supervision of St. Dominic. In an effort to balance the books, so to speak, members of the Friars Minor have also been included as part of the office. The Church has always exercised temperance in the operation of this office. The prayer has always been that justice is tempered with mercy controlled by the Holy Spirit. Pope St. Pius V died the year after the victory of Lepanto, on May 1, 1572. He was very loved by the people. He had not been with them that long as Pope, only six years. He had received a great vote of confidence after the Battle of Lepanto. He was mourned deeply by the populace of Rome. His body was transferred from St. Peter's Basilica to the Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome. He was buried in a special chapel and a statue of him sits on top of his tomb. He did not win the friendship of many of the European rulers during his papacy. He had a difficult situation to handle on many fronts and was not able to resort to diplomacy very much. When the situation called for tact, he tried to use it. He was not trying to win popularity contests, but he did not want to afford himself the luxury of being cold to an adversary when benevolence and compassion would have accomplished the desired result. He was a good man, a bull in a china shop, but he was God's man. To quote from one of his biographers, Behind the image of stern lawgiver, of a new Moses, which he projected, lay kindness and zeal for the well-being of the church. Besides guarding it against heresy and the might of Islam, he encouraged its expansion through the missions, and was a patron of learning, especially the ecclesiastical sciences. He was not indifferent to the arts, but thought of them principally as secondary to religion. Thus he left only a modest impression on the architecture of Rome. In effect, He didn't leave any monuments in stone which outlived him. He was not looking for a tribute to his name on earth, but rather in heaven. He was beatified 100 years to the day after his death, on May 1, 1672, and was subsequently canonized 40 years later on May 22, 1712. History has told a story of this strong man, totally committed to his God, his church, his religious order, and his children, the people of God. He has been found to be a powerful soldier of the Counter-Reformation. He did what he did to stem the tide of Protestantism in the only way he knew how. And the Church has honored and rewarded him by raising him to the communion of saints. No greater reward can be given to a man of God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving us this great defender of the faith at a time when we needed him desperately. Lord, we think you've given us a Pope St. Pius V today and Pope John Paul II. Please give him strength and health. We need him.